everyone, and welcome to the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. Together, we'll watch, snack, and chat our way through books and films set in the ancient world. We bring our expertise as ancient historians to the table to dissect every detail. We hope you'll grab your favourite beverage and snacks and join us every week on this adventure. Before we start spilling the tea, a brief note on our content. The Reading Party podcast is created for adult audiences. The stories of the ancient world are full of violence and undisguised sexual content, and your hosts aren't afraid to curse up a storm. For those reasons, this podcast is not suitable for under 18s, and certain episodes may not be suitable for those living with trauma. This season, we're focusing on stories set in ancient Egypt, and we'll be bringing in guest hosts that are subject matter experts to help us really dig into the history of what we're reading and watching. With that in mind, let's get going. Lexi and I have our teas and are so ready to start spilling the tea on a ton of ancient stories. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Reading Party podcast with your hosts, Megan and Lexi. Today, we're going to be talking about the Prince of Egypt animated DreamWorks movie, and we are very lucky to have the wonderful Dr. Rosalind A. Campbell joining us. Rose, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to chatting, and it's so lovely to be here. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Would you mind, before we get going, telling everyone who you are, what you specialize in, and if you have any exciting projects going on at the moment? Absolutely. Yeah. So as you mentioned, my name is Dr. Rosalind and Campbell. All of my friends just call me Rose. I am a bioarchaeologist and an Egyptologist. So I study human remains from archaeological contexts, mostly in Egypt, but I also work in Jordan. I worked in Peru a few times. Ethiopia in the past, before the current conflict, and other places as well. So I have a few different areas that I research. One of my primary interests is in trying to understand how governments and rulers use violence as a tool of power and how that shows up in human remains, which has a lot of implications for modern use of state-sanctioned violence, things like genocides, war, that kind of thing. So that's kind of my primary area of focus. I look at evidence for human sacrifice in ancient Egypt as a sort of form of state-sanctioned violence that might not be quite what we think it is. But I also study the history of cancer in ancient human remains. I've been working on that for a while with some colleagues. And actually, my newest project looks at depictions and player perceptions of gender in certain video games, things like Assassin's Creed, that are set in the ancient world and trying to understand how these games depict gender representation and diversity and things like that. And then how players perceive that so that as academics, we can really think about what are these preconceived notions that students are coming in with. You know, of course, they know these games aren't real, but maybe they think that there was great gender diversity or great gender equity in the past. And how can we talk about that and have conversations about that? That sounds amazing. And I have like four different interviews and I want to do with you. (laughs) Great. I'll come back anytime. Sounds great. So before we get into the movie, we do have to ask, because we all have beverages of some kind, we do have to say what we're drinking. Lexi, what do you have today? I have a green tea with lemon and I've added some honey, you know, got to keep the uh, (laughs) pipes well oiled. So yeah, pretty basic, but very good. Very tasty. I have sage and wild mint, which is less on the sweet side. I tend to prefer my herbal teas a bit sweeter, but it's a very nice flavor and I am enjoying it. How about you, Rose? I am the odd person out and have coffee, I'm afraid. Although I do love sage tea. I've drunk a lot of it in Jordan. It's delicious. But I have coffee with some sweet creamer. So I needed the caffeine and it was readily available. So No, that makes perfect sense. (laughs) My husband is a a coffee drinker. I am a tea drinker. And my two-year-old has picked up on this fact. And when she's playing kitchen, we'll bring him a coffee and bring me a tea. It's very kind of trained. 
Wait, who is it? Which one is it? it? Nora. It's not real coffee and tea. She has a little play kitchen and she'll bring us cups and say, here's your coffee. Well, here's then you tea. trained her right. You're raising her the right way. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> so, yeah, I think let's start this episode off in our normal fashion where Megan will provide us with a Bark Notes version of what happened. And then we'll get into it, ask Rose some questions and just talk about the things we like and don't and all that good stuff. So Megan, recap, please. Well, Prince of Egypt is essentially the Moses story. And if you don't know the Moses story, Moses is abandoned as a young child, floats down a river, much like Sargon of Akkad does in the Sargonic birth legend, but we're not going into that because this is not an episode about Mesopotamia. Anyway, Pharaoh is killing off all of the firstborn Hebrew sons because there's a prophecy that they will overthrow his dynasty and all this stuff. So being a good Pharaoh, he proceeds to kill everyone. And to save him, Moses' parents float him down the river. He gets found by a princess and then raised in the palace as their own son, because that's absolutely what would have happened if you find a random orphan child in a pool of water. Just, yeah, definitely Pharaoh would take him in and raise him as his own, wouldn't be raised in servitude at all. No. Anyway, this is a children's movie, so it's going to be a little bit nicer than than what might have actually happened. So he grows up with his brother Ramses and their best buddies, and it's lovely and wonderful. And then one day, Moses sees a Hebrew slave, an Israelite slave, being whipped very cruelly. And this is a problem for him. It's very sad. It is actually genuinely sad. I shouldn't sound quite so sarcastic. But this kind of triggers a course of events whereby Moses leaves well, he, he, I'm getting very confused about the order of, of activities. Okay, I can help. Yeah. Yeah, he please, because like, my brain is dude. not. No, I yes, know, it's fine. Actually, I'm having such a brain issue today. So he, he kills the dude, and then Pharaoh gets angry. He's like, why did you kill him? And he's like, I'm not who you think I am. Has this, like, trippy dream sequence, I guess, in his brain, but it's presented through song because child's movie it's great basically though he flees egypt and his brother's all like don't leave me and he's like goodbye wanders out in the desert for a while we can't really tell how long ends up sort of in the land of the Medes. midianites it's the midianites thank you basically falls in love with tapora becomes a shepherd does his thing and then of course god is like I'm going to come down and make you go back to Egypt in the form of a burning bush, which is like great, a little trippy, cool. That happens. I've always loved the animation. We can get into that later, but that is a thing. So then he goes back and suddenly he's like, I am religious now and I hear God's voice and he speaks to me and he's haunting me in a dream. So you need to like let my people go because otherwise uh, I'm going to be haunted forever. So yeah, that happens. And Pharaoh's like very stubborn. No, no, no. I will not let your people go gets very angry. And then we have the 10 plagues in a very awesome musical sequence, which is one of my favorite representations. We can get into that too. But then dun, 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 death of the firstborn, amazing animation comes in. Pharaoh's son dies. It's very sad, but also historically LOL because he did not just have one child, but we can get into that as well. But his son is dead. He is sad, says, get out of here. I don't want to see your face. It makes me angry. So then they leave and then Pharaoh changes his mind is like, that's stupid. Let's go get them. Then Moses proceeds to split the Red Sea. Then Pharaoh and his entire army essentially almost drown, except Sykes, Ramses doesn't drown, but his army is all gone. And then they make it to the land of milk and honey, supposedly. Uh, not really, because they have to wander more. But um, the movie ends with Moses coming down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. And it's all beautifully animated. I think I did it justice that was, there. That was a great, a great synopsis. I think better than mine because you got distracted far less than I typically get when I do my synopsis. So <laughs> yeah, but yours nice. are like pithy. Mine are just straightforward. I, I get a bit ranty sometimes. I think <laughs> a little bit ranty. You know what? I think that a good rant is always appreciated. So I think that. Thank you, thank you. I enjoy them, and they make Lexi laugh. So I, I just get to sit here ranting to my heart's content and watch her cracking up on screen. And, and I love it. Yeah. Hopefully the audience enjoys them. It's better than therapy, honestly. Like, it is my therapy. So I am very happy to let you rant. But <laughs> yeah, I wanted to move us forward so we could all rant together. So that was our little synopsis. So let's pick a place to dive in. I don't know. Where would either of you like to start? Megan, did you have notes? I did not have notes because I have too many. 
in my brain. I didn't for this one because it, it's such a familiar story. And I like the things that I normally pick up on a the Exodus as an a historical events anyway. So I'm sure we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. We could start with the most basic one, I guess, mm -hmm. which is for people unfamiliar with Egyptian history and biblical history. Is this Ramesses the second or what Ramesses is this? Because there's a lot of Ramesses out there, man. I don't think this is actually given, is it? So they say that it's Ramses and that has father of Seti. I think we're supposed to understand that this is Ramses the Great, which is very, very broadly a similar time to what the biblical exodus is supposed to have occurred. But there were many Ramses. There was, I think we got up to like 11. There were many. So I think we're supposed to sort of understand that it's Ramses the Great because that is the one everybody knows about and it's usually the only one people know about. And of course, you know, his name is all over Egypt, mostly because he took other people's monuments and carved his name on top of theirs. And I am not kidding you. He knew because, you know, you see the people that are going to be like you. And he was like, I don't want someone else to do this like I did. So he carved his name in so deep that sometimes I can stick my whole hand into those hieroglyphs. They are inches deep so that nobody else would do it. So his name is everywhere, which could easily make you think that he was the only king. And he did reign for a very long time. He was very successful for the most part, given a definition of success. Um, but Egypt did pretty well under his reign. But he also put his name everywhere and this is sort of a running joke in egyptology because his name is just on everything and he, clearly some of it he did not make but he put his name on it anyways i mean it's a successful strategy in some ways everyone knows who he is thousands of years later it's like the ancient form of recycling yeah yeah just instead of building new monuments for yourself you just appropriate other people's monuments it's, it's great far more Love efficient it. in many ways it, it takes is. a lot it of is. time to build all those monuments and it takes more resources. And, and really what we're looking at is Ramses as like an earth warrior. It's oh. like a green, socially conscious pharaoh. I don't believe that for one second. It's <laughs> propaganda, of course. But I'm, that's the narrative I'm going to go with in my head now. So, I like it. Thank you. One thing I did want to ask, because this is something I do struggle to get a handle on, is workforce in ancient Egypt. Are we looking predominantly at slave labor like you get through Prince of Egypt and, and other movies like that? Or was it more indentured servitude, like workers being paid for their labor? What, what really was going on there? This is such a common discussion point because I think if you, especially if you've been raised in any sort of Judeo-Christian environment, or even if you just don't know Egyptology all that well, which of course, many people, why would you? I think there is this perception in popular media that slaves built the pyramids and there was widespread slavery and things like that. The answer is certainly more complicated, but the short version is we don't really have evidence of any kind of large-scale slavery like this in Egypt. Certainly nothing like the shadow slavery of the U.S., not at all. It, it, that's not to say some forms of indentured servitude or slavery didn't exist. So it seems like what we did have at various points in time is captives from wartime and things like that might be made into servants or slaves, but then sort of adopted into Egyptian society, which I'm not saying they were treated great or, it was, you know, we're going to set that aside for the moment. But it does seem that many of them could sort of earn their freedom. It wasn't necessarily hereditary. There was more, there was a culture of servants, certainly, and serving people. But what's interesting about the pyramids, for example, is we do actually have records of who built those. We have the houses, we have the bodies in many cases of the people who worked on the pyramids. And it seems that they were just Egyptians. The sort of prevailing theory right now is that probably the way it worked is, you know, in the past, before the Aswan Dam, the Nile River would flood for a few months every year, bringing this rich soil up from Ethiopia. And while that would flood all the agricultural fields, and of course, Egypt's predominant industry at that time was agriculture. You can't farm while all the fields are flooded. You have to wait for the floods to recede. And so the theory amongst most scholars is that probably during this time, Egyptian citizens and farmers were expected to sort of work on these large building projects. And maybe there was some system where some people worked for certain months and other people worked for other months. 
But we have records from where they lived. There's some archaeologists working in the area around the Giza pyramids, for example, and they were given state rations. We have evidence of medical care where there are broken bones because this is hard labor. Pyramids are big and the stones are heavy. So this is still very difficult labor. But it seems that they had access to some level of health care. So it's it's sort of a weird hybrid thing. It's not quite indentured servitude or maybe it's temporary indentured servitude. It's maybe a good a good correlation would be like in certain parts of Europe and things like that where you're expected, especially the young men, to do a certain period of military military service, right, for like a couple years or something. I have a friend who's German and that was the practice for a very long time. And so I think that might be a slightly closer comparison where it wasn't necessarily all year maybe, but maybe when the Nile flooded, all the farmers went and worked on the pyramids. And if you get enough people doing that for a long enough time, you can you can make pretty good progress. So what we're looking at is maybe a, an obligation of labor, but it's labor that you are paid for and, and you receive care if you are injured. It seems that way. Yeah. I'm not saying they were really well compensated, <laughs> but, you know, and, and in a lot of ways, you know, this wasn't, necessarily, this was a cashless society. So they didn't have money at this time or currency. So you would trade. So most people throughout Egyptian history were paid in things like food, right? So they would get rations of flour and grain and beer because people didn't drink the water because there's parasites and things in it. Um, so you would get rations and things like that, and then some level of care, it seems like, and then and then you would go back to your regular life because you also have to farm during part of the year as well. Thank you. That's really, that's kind of what I was expecting, but it's interesting to hear and it's nice to have that wasn't slaves thing. <laughs> doesn't seem that way. We don't really have evidence for the kind of slavery that people usually associate with this kind of labor. doesn't mean it was easy labor, but it <laughs> seems like different. I don't want to jump around, but I do kind of want to jump around. So I'm going to make the executive decision. I'm going to jump around because I do want to get to that burning bush scene. That's wild. That's just wild. And maybe it's just been on my mind because, uh, Rose, just so you know, Megan and I did review Exodus Gods and Kings earlier in our season. And the representations are completely different. Like that one, it was like a burning bush but with like a, a literal child like a creepy quite a little scary, child creepy child going on yeah as the voice of god and this one is just a lot more like the voice of the flame yeah yeah i don't know megan you do some biblical stuff i know you're more a seriology but man i know you had thoughts please please i just really enjoy honestly the whole movie and i enjoy the animation style and I did think that the way the way Prince of Egypt does the whole voice of God thing, it's it, it does I think it does a good job of making this kind of powerful, forceful presence without there being a creepy child. Because the, yeah, the creepy child thing is just weird. But it's it's a nice kind of bridge between like having a physical anthropomorphic deity there and yelling at someone and having this be completely imaginary. It's a nice, like, severe voice of you will do what the hell I say and I, you just don't have any kind of choice about it, really. And I did like the burning bush. It's a good, it's a good animation sequence. I mean, I'm just curious because I, I noticed, and this is like the first time, I've watched this movie so many times. This is the first time I really decided to pay attention to it. But the 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 gradient of like, color that they used for it you know and the cave is quite specific but then i noticed like it, it kind of transfers over because then when you have god doing anything especially when they get back to egypt the color palette changes and it's just i don't know like it's 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 weird because it brings like a severity and it, i feel like it tones down the colors whatever colors are there in Egypt, but then you you like contrast that right to like the bright festivals and sort of the technicolor aspect of all the the beautiful things that are happening when he's you know away, and so I think to me it gave off this really interesting sentiment of like Egypt is strict and the color is is meant to be depressing and 
terrible. Honestly, to me, it just the way they use color makes a statement. And so for Rose here, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, hey, we have a lot of evidence, right, for, for ancient Greece being really colorful. But for Egypt, I mean, you know, what we see and think about today is kind of the, the color, the, the desert and the sand and kind of the, the worn away look. How colorful was ancient Egypt? Was it like Greece? Was it like Technicolor kind of or not really? Good question. A lot of things were brightly colored. And I think we've lost some of that color from certain things. I I will admit that I'm not an expert on the statuary. So I'm not sure if we think those were as brightly colored as some have theorized the Greek statues are, although there's a lot of debate about that. But there are a lot of colors. I mean, if you look at the tombs and the temples and things like that that are preserved, there's a lot of bright colors. I mean, they made this Egyptian blue with really rare materials. They used red and yellow ochre. There's this part of Egypt you can, well, you you used to be able to walk through, but it's in one of the small valleys in between the village, Daryl Medina, that was inhabited by the people who built the Valley of the Kings and the Temple of Hatshepsut, the female queen, Daryl Bahri. And there's this little valley you can walk through and there's just fragments of ochre, red ochre, yellow ochre, other things all over the ground. And it looks incredible. It's beautiful. And so, yeah, I think it was really colorful in a lot of ways. Of course, we also have to remember that the things that we have left are the tombs and the temples and not necessarily as much the houses or even the palaces. We don't have a lot of great evidence for these palaces. And I have thoughts about the palaces in Prince of Egypt. We can come back to that later. But, you know, it's hard to say what their homes would have looked like because those were made out of mud brick. So basically you get together this sort of silty clay mud that the from the Nile soil and you would either, usually you would just let it dry in the sun. Great material for building. It's sturdy. It keeps it cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Does not last super well for thousands of years. So it's hard to say what their homes would have looked like. But I think there is certainly a love for color and color had meaning, you know, color was associated with certain ideas. You know, the flesh of the gods was supposed to be gold because it didn't decay. And black was associated with this really rich, fertile Nile soil and rebirth and things like that. So there was a love for color for sure. And I think if I go slightly on a tangent here for a moment, one of the things I actually love about this movie I was so excited when you asked me to discuss it because I've been singing the praises of this movie for a long time. But one of the things I love about this movie is what I think you could describe as the cinematography. It is filmed like an epic live action masterpiece. And it's an animated movie. You don't always see that. But this use of color, this use of lighting, right? The the way they juxtapose images and fade things out and fade things in, they are really telling a very epic story in a way that I think is often underappreciated by people who are like, oh, it's an animated kids movie, which it is, but it's, it is really beautifully done, I think. And the way they use color and lighting to, like you said, make things feel more severe and to highlight contrasts and, you know, this, in your words, severity of this God saying, let my people go versus what I think we are supposed to understand as the sort of decadence of Egypt and its bright colors and things like that. And I think that is done very effectively if you're watching closely in this movie. And that's one thing I I, I think it's really well done. I absolutely agree with you. And I think one of the things that I've always loved about this film is just the visual feel of it. It's so beautiful and it's so well thought out. I mean, obviously animation has to be well thought out because you're someone is drawing all of the panels, but the amount of thought I think that went into things like the lighting is really, really impressive. And I need you to talk to me about palaces now, please. I've seen this movie many times, but I rewatched it last night just in preparation for this. And I noticed, so as a little bit of background, we don't have a lot of evidence We have some archaeological remains for palaces in Egypt, but it seems like most of the time they were built with mud brick. And so we have sort of the the edges of the walls, a series of small walls, if you've ever watched Eddie or Susie Izzard. But we don't have standing palaces really left. And what I thought was interesting in this movie is 
they're really trying to code for us, the audience, what Egyptian is. And the mo- one of the most Egyptian things to us is these giant temples that are left. And so they make the palaces look like the giant temples. And if you look at the king's palace, it looks like the temple of Karnak that is still in existence today with the giant pylons and the flags and the statues. And it's not, you know, it's like not an exact replica, but this idea of these monumental huge gates, that is directly from the existing temples that we have. And I think on the my understanding on the part of the filmmakers was that they're trying to make sure we know that we're in Egypt, right? There are many nonverbal ways to tell us that we're in Egypt. And so they make these palaces that look like something we as the audience will automatically recognize as Egyptian. It also extends to the imagery, some of the decoration and things like that that you see in this these palaces. Those are scenes from tombs and things like that. But we as the audience think, oh, that looks very Egyptian. Yeah, okay. And if you don't know that those are tomb scenes, you will understand that this is Egypt. And I'm not saying that as a critique at all. I think that's such an interesting commentary on what we as the public think of as, you know, quote, Egyptian and and what we recognize as Egyptian. And it's important to remember that that is mostly from tombs and temples, not homes and palaces, but homes of the dead, if you will. And I think that's really interesting. It's it's fascinating the way that public knowledge and perception of the ancient world is so heavily skewed, as I think it has to be towards the few archaeological remains we have, because it's all you have to visualize. So with Egypt, of course, you're going to get tombs and temples it just, it is what it is. And with Greece and Rome, you have this glistening white marble, which bears no resemblance to how it actually would have been during ancient and classical times. I really, I had no idea that we didn't have any actual, like obviously not standing palaces, but any more palace remains than than a couple of small walls. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, we have a few different areas where people have been excavating palaces, but for the most part, what they found is yeah, the walls and then sometimes statues and things like that. But to my knowledge, we don't have any standing palaces. And the the general theory is because they were mostly made out of mud brick. They might have had stone elements, certainly. But it's also important to remember we're talking about thousands of years, right? And so even some of the stone buildings would have been dismantled to reuse the stone. Recycling, right? Just like Ramsey is a green warrior. If you have well-cut stone that is readily available, why would you just let it sit there in some ways? Absolutely. Why, this is another tangent, are there any theories as to why temples get stone but palaces get mud brick if Pharaoh is a divine figure? That's a good question. I think I think in part, and this is not my area of expertise, so, you know, take this with a grain of salt. I mostly study human remains, not the homes they lived in. I think in part it's because temples were to the gods and were supposed to be an eternal monument to that king's dedication to the gods, as well as an offering to the gods in many ways. And they were also supposed to glorify that ruler you know, I've been saying king because almost all of our rulers were male. There's a few exceptions, which are fascinating. But I think that the temple was considered more important in some ways because the palace is just where the king lives and where industry happens and 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 business happens. But and I think we do have some evidence, if I remember correctly, of some areas that were probably made out of stone and they just haven't survived. But the temples were eternal. They were for the eternal king and for the eternal gods. And so I think they glorify the king in such a way that maybe there wasn't really, why do you need to glorify the house they live in? Because you're making an eternal house for them anyways, and for their cult, right? And for their eternal spirit. So my sort of non-expert in this <laughs> in this aspect, my non-expert opinion would be, there's just no reason to make a house. It's just a house. To. That would also answer the why why tombs get the same kind of stone treatment because it's intended to last forever. Yeah, right. You want because part of the reason to have a tomb that lasts forever is 
at least in certain periods, you have magical spells in there that will ensure that your spirit is kept alive and fed for all of eternity. You want that to last forever because if those spells get destroyed, then your spirit might die forever, you know, the eternal death. So I think it's a different viewpoint in this long view, right, of I want to last forever. I know my physical body will die, but I need to ensure that my spirit lasts forever. Also, I, I'm pretty sure I remember talking about this or reading about it or something at some point. And it always struck me. I'm like, yeah, why would you want to model your house after a tomb? Also, just because like, aren't they supposed to be like super dark? And like the only place of light is like where the statue, the God would have been because like that's where the light's supposed to be or whatever. It's like playing around with the directional whatever. So I'm just like, wouldn't that make your house like super dark? I mean, I think the houses had windows probably, but it's also hot. And so fewer windows means that it stays a little bit cooler as well. And mud brick is a really good insulator. It stays much cooler in the summer. Yeah. I mean, I think as far as darkness is concerned, the Egyptians, the world arose out of sort of the dark and formless waters. It's kind of like in some versions of the, the Judeo-Christian creation story, darkness wasn't necessarily bad, it was a return to sort of the beginning of all things. And so with temples, you will sometimes see this as you get farther into the temple, because you're sort of recreating that moment, that, that first moment, that first occurrence of creation. I think with tombs, it's in part hidden because you don't want people messing with it. So I think it's less about we don't want light in some ways and more about you don't want people screwing this up because you want your spirit to live forever and people are corruptible and might go disturb things, right? So, and I think it's important to remember too that we in our modern society are often quite separated from death. And so we see it as very frightening and bad and dark. And I think in a lot of other societies, ancient as well as modern, that encounter death with more immediacy and more frequently, death is not necessarily this horrifying, terrifying thing that we associate it with. I'm not saying they're going to go run around and play in tombs per se, but there are a lot of cultures where they interact with the dead bodies of their ancestors all the time in their homes and other places. And that's not considered, you know, icky or anything we are just so separated from death in our Western society, right? If someone dies, they're taken away to a funeral home and then they're sort of displayed or we cremate them or something. It's a very separate thing. We don't always have those wakes in our homes and, and cemeteries are separate in a way. And, and it's a very different viewpoint than a lot of other cultures. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I don't think about that enough, but also I don't do anything that really makes me have to think about it. So, which I guess makes you the perfect person, our wonderful resident local bone and death and whatever expert. So I did want to ask because it's the one thing that always gets me historically, but also just other things. You know, you have the 10 plagues and then you have death of the firstborn son, which would have been devastating. I'm not taking anything away from that. This is a man, though, who historically was supposed to have, like, a hundred children. So, like, I mean, I understand for simplified narrative purposes, probably. Like, okay, just kill his one son. And then, you know, you see the, the impetus. But do you think they could have been a little more, I don't know, closer to historical reality where, like, you could give him a couple kids, but, like, just say he's, like, the favorite. And so he was so devastated that his favorite child is dead. He needs to let them go. Because I'm just like, that's a really screwed way to say he had one child. No Egyptian pharaoh had one child. I'm sorry. Unless it was the end of a dynasty. But, you know. Well, even then. You know, this is where <laughs> I think there's a lot of things converging. You have the biblical story, which is crafting a particular narrative. And then you have the need, of course, to make a compelling movie and a compelling story, right? I think you're right. Like, certainly we have evidence that Ramses the Great, uh, Ramses the Second had dozens of children. So there is that. Of course, it's quite possible he had a favorite. The other side of that is child mortality and infant mortality was very high in the ancient world in most cultures. So as upsetting as that would be, it's also not that it would have been 
perhaps less out of the ordinary than it might be for us now. I think there's, this is tricky, right? Because as a biblical story, there is certainly a narrative in this firstborn son. And I think what you might also be seeing here is a a convergence of different values, where one culture in this movie, the Hebrews, is valuing this firstborn son as sort of the heir and this kind of thing. Whereas in Egypt, it was usually the children of the sort of head wife or queen that would inherit. But we have lots of cases where some of those died as well. And a a child, a son of a lesser, lesser as in lower ranking queen or wife or something like that took over. The other thing to consider, though, is if we take this at face value and in one night, all of the firstborn sons in Egypt all died at once. It's not just that that king's son. That is a huge loss in population that is really abrupt, more than any disease and very targeted. So I think maybe instead of thinking of, oh, he was just so devastated by the loss of his first son, of course that's devastating. I think maybe also we want to consider that they just wiped out a huge portion of the population in one night with no apparent effort. That is terrifying psychologically, right? All of the firstborn sons dying in this entire country in one night that is enough to really make anybody think twice, I think. So I think the movie presents it as he's so devastated by the loss of his only child, which is fair. But I think we also want to consider the broader context. That's all of Egypt suddenly grieving and clamoring for what is going on? Are, are these people causing this devastation? And that's a powerful force also. Sort of public opinion. Yeah, no, for sure. I know, obviously, we're told that the ancient world very broadly, but but especially Egypt, right? It's known for having a lot of sickness, illness going around. So I'm just kind of curious, like, yeah, do we have a comparable thing in history around this time, around this whatever, where, you know, was there a great plague that hit Egypt, which is sort of how this biblical story took hold? Because I know things were always going around in the ancient world, especially Egypt, but... This is hard because you've hit upon one of the challenges of bioarchaeology, of studying human remains in the past. So on the one hand, no, we do not have evidence of, for example, a plague around this time. The problem is we very frequently don't have evidence of illness in the past because especially with contagious diseases, usually a person will die before we get evidence in the bones, but the bones are what survive for thousands of years. So it's very common to find human remains and have no idea what caused death. I mean, I wish this was like CSI or bones or something where you could just say, oh, I found a finger and now I know exactly how this person died and how old they were. That is simply not the case. So we don't have evidence of that, but we might not have evidence of it whether it happened or not, because you know, it, it would be different, especially if they died all in one night, right? What would the evidence even look like? I have no idea. If it was an illness or some, or, or the divine hand of God or whatever, that might not show up in the bones. And to compound this, the skeletons of children and infants tend to preserve much worse in the archaeological record than adults because their bones are smaller. They tend to be more porous. And so even if not to get dark here for a second, but let's say they had broken bones, they might not survive for thousands of years. So this is part of the tricky thing is we don't have the evidence for it, but absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. And this is sort of the conundrum of bioarchaeology overall. Mm. Thank you for, for explaining that in a better way than I think either of us could ever try to. I remember in a conversation we were having at one point, when you said, you know, you, you, you've had some, some medical issues, but, you know, if someone were to find your bones, right, you could see the, the trauma on them. And I remember it stuck with me when you're like, yeah, if someone like a thousand years from now found my bones, I could probably see like I broke this bone or whatever. So I was like, oh, that's so cool. I wonder, you know, can we, is there a lot of evidence for that? So sad. I mean, we don't like child death. No, but. No. Broken bones are something that you can often see, even if they've healed, because the bone will restructure itself a little bit differently. But we humans, we are so fragile in so many ways. There are so many ways that we can die that don't show up 
on our bones. And, and that is the great challenge of bioarchaeology is most of the time we're trying to figure out what happened during this person's life and reconstruct their health, their general health and activity patterns and that kind of thing. But there's a, a lot of information that's just going to be lost. You know, I have broken bones. So in theory, if my bones were to survive for thousands of years, when someone found them, they would probably be able to tell. But they might not be able to tell, for example, that I have terrible migraines because that's not going to show up on my bones. So there's just a lot of information we can't necessarily access. What information can you get from bones just to kind of go on the positivist route? Yeah. What kinds of things can you tell about a person's life looking at their bones? You can tell a lot in some cases. You know, if you have really good preservation, you can look at things like you can get a general idea of biological age. Depending on how much of the skeleton is preserved, you might be able to get a pretty good age estimate about how old they were when they died. You can get information about biological sex. Now, this doesn't necessarily tie to gender, of course, so that's a whole other conversation. But you can often get information about biological sex. If it's a biological female, you can sometimes tell if they've given birth. Depending on things like muscle attachments, you might be able to tell if a person did repeated motions or heavy labor over a long time. So, you know, there's people doing studies about this all over the world, but things like some of the people who constructed the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, for example, and, you know, some of my colleagues looking at those human remains and evidence that they hiked up and down those hills between their village and the Valley of the Kings a lot, probably carrying heavy loads because of those developed muscles and the strain on, on those attachment, where those muscles attach to your bones. You can get some information about various diseases. It depends. So some infectious diseases like tuberculosis, if you have it long enough, will show up in your bones sometimes. Things like certain forms of cancers will show up in your bones. Broken bones, especially if it's a severe break, you can look at stuff like that. If you're able to do certain types of testing of teeth or bones, you can sometimes tell what kinds of protein someone was eating, whether they were eating seafood or land animals, where they were getting their drinking water, which can then give you information about where they lived, where if they moved around from childhood to adulthood, things like that. So there is a lot of information you can get from the bones. There's just also information you can't. And I think it's really important to acknowledge those gaps while also highlighting the information we can gain and how we can restore some identity to some of these people from the past. Thank you very much. We have uh, a few minutes left in our time. Lexi, was there anything else from the movie you wanted to cover? Absolutely. Always. There's too much. A lot of the most, well, I would say, I would call them the most pivotal, important moments in this film happen through song. So I want to know, what is everyone's favorite song? And I can start and give you two a moment to think. I do love all of them, but because I cannot choose all of them, I'm going to... And I, and I have different ones at different ages of my life, which very indicative of uh, how much I changed my mind. But I'm going to use the one that I've had maybe since high school. And it's kind of the playful one because there's so many deep songs in there. But I always love playing with the big boys because when I was in high school and for a minute there, when I thought I was going to become an Egyptologist, I was like, I need to sound smart. And they say a lot of the names of the gods, like so many of the gods. So I was like, I'm going to memorize the song. So that way I've memorized the names of the gods and then I'll just learn about them, fill in the gaps and be sounding very smart. So I did that in high school. And so that was my like karaoke thing. That was my thing to impress people. I was just like singing it. So that way I could just really say the names of all the Egyptian gods and people would be like, oh, so impressive. And then I'd be like, not really. It's just Prince of Egypt, but thank you. But it also, you know, because the, the song is multi-layered, it's supposed to be fun and catchy and you do, but you learn a lot about the, the, the gods' names, but also like you kind of just see like, it gives you that dimension of like, yeah, Egypt had so many and each one had a different role and function and, and blah, blah, blah. And then you're comparing it sort of through a fun animation to the snake. And you're like, your stick, your snake. Good luck with that, you know? So I was like, oh, this is cool. So yeah, playing with the big boys was favorite of high school Lexi's. That's actually my favorite, to be honest. 
I really love it. The music, the key it's in. I love the animation that goes along with it. It's it's just so much fun. And the attitude of the Egyptian priests is, oh, perfect arrogance. I love it. I feel like I knew you were going to say that was your favorite, but I kind of was like, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt and be like, obviously the no. Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, when you believe is like the best. Okay. I'm very happy to know we're, we're aligned on this. Yeah, No, the Whitney Houston is also beautiful, but playing with the big boys is just, it's, it's a masterpiece. It's also my favorite. It's a fantastic song. I love it. But I do also really enjoy, well, of course, the Whitney Houston Mariah. That one's fantastic. But I actually also like the Deliver Us song at the very beginning. I think in part because of the, the visuals, the way they juxtapose sort of the working Egyptians and then the, the sort of river lullaby fits in there too, which I think is really beautiful. So if I wanted to sound, you know, cultured and educated, I would probably say one of those, but it's definitely playing with the big boys. It's so fun. And who doesn't love Martin Short and Steve Martin just joking around as ridiculous Egyptian priests? I absolutely love it. It's that's definitely my favorite. I mean, all the animations line up with the like body types that they assign the characters. You have like the short squat one and then you have the tall one. I think my only disappointment is that they didn't have them in the like leopard leopard fur leopard skin that is not what priests usually wear so actually that was probably mostly like the high priests so in theory what the movie is telling us is that these are not as high priests as i think they are uh however it probably wasn't that conscious <laughs> i like that i like that that plays right? really nicely with their personalities <laughs> it does right so we do have some evidence that some of the high ranking priests wore that but not all of them for sure so and i'm not positive I think it was most time periods we have evidence that that was the higher ranking priest. So maybe there are many aspects of this movie that indicate they did a lot of research. So maybe it is a kind of subtle dig at they're not quite as hotshot as they think they are. I mean, I fair assumption. I just I thought it was funny because, I mean, probably pharaohs traveled everywhere, meeting with all the priests. But I just thought it was funny that for the purposes of this film they were like the ones he turned to he, you know anything goes wrong Hotep, hoy, like fix this i don't know what to do you are the masters you know so i'm just like oh well okay maybe it was a subtle dig. i that would make it much funnier and i'm going to i think think of it that way it's going to be my head cannon from now on right i <laughs> me too me too but i think i agree like deliver us is always a top favorite of mine as well also it's ofrahaza singing and hans are like fell in love with her voice. So I did too. It's fine. We're fine. And the little reprise of it at the end is gorgeous. Um, yes, definitely like second favorite song for sure. I mean, you can't not like any of the songs, but you know. All of, of them course. are so good. All of them are just, it's such right? an excellent movie. The music is so great. I mean, what a stellar cast. The cinematography, there's so much about it that's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I know. I always, it trips me up when I'm like Michelle Pfeiffer's Sephora and I'm like, oh my God, you could have cast that better. Wow. So I, there's so many big names, you know, like I said, I was rewatching it last night and I remembered the big cast, but I forgot Patrick Stewart. I mean, they got everyone for this movie and it's amazing to me how many big names they got playing these, you know, animated characters. I love it. I love it when you're watching an animated movie and you're like, I know those voices. I don't know where I know them from, but they are, they're doing, they're killing it. They're clearly very seasoned actors. I know that voice. And then I have to Google it and I'm like, oh, that's why I know the voice. It's a Patrick Stewart, one of the most famous actors of all time. Right. I have IMDb on my phone for this exact reason, because I'm always like, who is this person? Who is this person? <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Great cast. Such a good cast. I know. And, and it always, it never fails to amaze me that I'm like, that's Val Kilmer and Val Kilmer can sing. Like, I know not all of the main cast does their own singing. I know that Rafe, no, Rafe does sing. Rafe Fiennes does sing actually as Ramses. Yeah, I oh think he gosh. does. Yeah. And actually does speak, speaking of Val Kilmer, I had forgotten that he also plays the voice of God in the, especially in the burning bush, but all of them. And I kind of love that because it's, it's like inside Moses's head, right? So he's hearing the voice of God, but in his own voice. And I think that's such a clever way to do it. 
that he hears the voice of God through his own through his own voice. That is very yeah. cool. It's more indicative kind of, of what I would imagine would be the human experience if you are one who claims that you hear the voice of God. I mean, we don't know the, don't know what his voice sounds like. So wouldn't it come through your own mental voice anyway? So like it's kind of mimicking real life in that regard. Well, and they've, there's all these studies about sort of something like half the population hears their thoughts in their head in their own voice and like the other half doesn't. I am definitely one of those people who hear my thoughts sort of in my voice. So it makes perfect sense to me because a thought is sort of expressed in your head in your own voice. And I was really flabbergasted when I found out that half the population doesn't have that or something like that. So I like that nod to sort of how people sometimes think. No, for sure. So I want to ask just as we're wrapping up from a Egyptological perspective. Is this the kind of thing you would recommend to someone who is interested in learning something about Egypt or seeing something visually about Egypt? Oh, this is a tough one. I love this movie. I don't think I would say, hey, watch this for the accuracy. <laughs> but I I love this movie. And I think what I have done in the past is talk about this with my students or have them watch it and and talk about not only what things are depicted accurately or inaccurately, but what I think is a more interesting question, which is why? Why are things depicted in a certain way? What is the agenda? Not necessarily with any judgment or anything, but this is why I'm doing, like I mentioned, that video game study, right? This is what I'm interested in. Why are we showing things in a certain way, like imagery from tombs and temples, right? Just like I said earlier, why are we doing that? Well, we need to code to the audience that this is Egypt. And what do most people recognize as Egypt? So I think I would recommend it as a great film overall. I don't think I would say this is a fantastic representation of Egyptian history, but so many things in entertainment are not. And that's okay because they're there for entertainment purposes. We just have to acknowledge that and and be a little bit critical that doesn't mean we can't enjoy them i love this movie i love the mummy movies i love all sorts of this sort of egyptomania stuff you just have to go in i think knowing that this is not intended to recreate the past but to present a version of that for our entertainment which is fine that's an awesome answer and i really like the wise when i was an undergraduate I was awful to watch historical movies with because I, I got so frustrated with the inaccuracies. And then I took a classical studies reception class with a guy called Gideon Nesbitt. And we went through a bunch of Greek inspired TV. And he was like, we're not interested in what's accurate or inaccurate. We're interested in how this is being used to what effect. And it completely snapped my viewing to a different perspective. And it's much more interesting. It's really fascinating to look at something and say, I know this isn't accurate, but it's really interesting the effect that including that has on like the overall movie, TV show, and as my experience as a viewer. Maybe that's a lens we need to approach the rest of the River God series with because the historical accuracy part is killing me because it's not accurate at all. So thank you for those wonderful final thoughts. Megan, <laughs> you have helped me. A lot. I, try, I try. I need to now apply them myself to the River God books. I know. So Rose, did you tell people where they can find you? I don't think I did. So uh, I do have a website with rosalindacampbell.com. And I am also, I've been advertising this video game study and things like that. I must confess that I'm not as good at social media as I probably should be. So, you know, we all have our things to work on, uh, but I am on Twitter. I believe my handle is Roses Bones. And I also have an Instagram account under the same name. So I can send you all of those if you want to put those in the show notes or something. We will absolutely put those in the show notes. Rose, thank you so much for joining us. This was really fun and very informative. It's been such a pleasure. This has been really enjoyable for me and so fun to chat with you both about this movie and nerd out a little bit about this movie we all enjoy. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's one of, one of my favorite things, nerding out with other nerds. Bye! Bye. 
Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week. Mm-hmm.